Hello, everybody. Praise the Lord. Have you had a good week? Ace. Can, remember, can you remember what I spoke about last week in the communion? The covering of the blood? Uh-huh, yeah. Well, I've had a chance to share that several times this week already, and um, it's been really encouraging that people often don't realize that the old covenant and the new covenant are connected. For those of you who don't know, I had um, a little cuddly lamb I brought with me, and I explained that in the Exodus story, when people took a lamb, unblemished of the first year a male lamb, that blood was not only going to protect them, it was going to deliver them from Egypt, it was going to prosper them, they all left prosperous, and they were going to go to the promised land, and they're all healed. And I said, if that was the blood of an animal, which was a lamb, how much more the blood of the Lamb of God for us that does all of those things and more for us. So tonight I'm going to share a little bit about, some of you might know, I went to a place called Mongolia, uh -huh. a few weeks ago, April time, with Feed the Hungry, international Christian charity, and it was an amazing time. It's hard to share really about you know, the very essence of when you're there and you're feeling it, and people know who've done mission what I mean here, when you're actually living it there. So when I thought about what to share, I thought, I don't want to make it boring because people start nodding off and go, oh, it's just like a boring itinerary. I got up, I had toast. It's not going to be like that, so don't worry. What I'm going to try and extract from the trip for you is what is God saying about Mongolia? What did he say to us? What did we get out of it in terms of spiritual things? And what is the legacy of that trip to Mongolia? So just a little bit to set the scene. Mongolia, I can see it up there, look, there it is is the land of the blue sky. There's the flag there with the blue sky. And there's somebody you might recognize on the other photo, um, is my good self. So a little bit of potted history of Mongolia. Mongolia really was a Buddhist nation. Well, it still is really a Buddhist nation or shamanism, that kind of thing. And when the communists came along in the 1920s, because communism took hold of Mongolia in 1920, they stopped all of that. They stopped people with freedom of movement and religion and whatever else. So they shut most of the Buddhist monasteries. They shut all of the churches. Well, there weren't any churches anyway. And people were controlled because it was a totalitarian state. And it was not a pleasant time, obviously. But communism came to an end in Mongolia, as it did in Eastern Europe in 1990. And freedom for people was gradually increased. So what happened was the Buddhist monastery started to open up again. But praise God, the church also started to grow in Mongolia. In 1990, they thought there was approximately about 10, 20 born-again believers in Mongolia. But now there's probably about 60-odd thousand, apparently. Praise the Lord. So God is working in Mongolia. Amazing stuff. So... The figures today are about like this, 5% Muslim, 86% Buddhist or shaman, 2% Christian, doesn't sound a lot, but the church is on the move. So what did I get out of it? Well, it was an amazing place to be. Obviously, Mongolia has still got a lot of hang-ups. There's about over 4,000 street children in Ulaanbaatar, which is the capital of Mongolia. And there's a huge problem with alcoholism because we met a lot of believers who, and often their testimony was they, they beat or they got through alcoholism and got born again. So there's some, some amazing testimonies there. So the picture of me on the right is in Ulaanbaatar. And when I shared with the church in Henti, which is a city in Mongolia, I said to them, well, you know, my name is Marco. And when I was young, people used to think it was really funny to call me Marco Polo. But you know what? When I was in your city, in your main city of Ulaanbaatar, I came across a, a statue called Marco Polo. So do you know what? I felt really at home in Mongolia. So I thought that was ace. And I brought greetings from, you know, Victory Church is getting around the world, folks. I stood in Mongolia and I said, greetings from Victory Church. So, you know, we're, we're getting around. And uh, so that's the first slide. Thank you, Judy. Now, this, this guy... If you've heard of Genghis Khan before, I'm not going to say too much about him, but he's got a bit of a, a legacy. And when communism fell in Mongolia, people were free to do what they wanted to do again. 
And Genghis Khan became kind of like the national hero again. It's sort of risen and risen and risen. And it's really gripping the nation. And the prime minister said recently, Genghis Khan was not really such a bad guy, you know. He just had a lot of bad press. He is like a god to us. That's the prime minister of Mongolia. So as you can see, Genghis Khan and the legacy he had, which wasn't a particularly good legacy, is um, quite powerful force over Mongolia. Um, he was the head of the Mongol Empire, which is probably the biggest empire the world has ever known so far. And his name is everywhere. Genghis Khan Airport, Genghis Khan Sweeties, Genghis Khan Bottled Water, Genghis Khan Street, everywhere you go. Even one of the towns we went to, Hendi, they're going to rename it Genghis Town because this is where Genghis Khan was born. So on the left is um, Genghis Khan from the parliament building in the main city square in Ulaanbaatar. On the right, when we were on the journey from Ulaanbaatar to Henti, it was six hours on the coach, and on a Mongolian coach, it was a bit of, a, bit of an eye-opener, shall we say. But anyway, on the way, we came across this incredibly big statue, which is about 40 meters high, standing on a 10-meter tall building. And this is Genghis Khan, and they've used about 250 tons of stainless steel in the construction of their god, Genghis Khan. So you're traveling along on the coach, and there's nothing, it's just like wilderness, and suddenly, there's Genghis Khan. And he's looking in the direction of his town, Henti, where he was born. So you can see straight away, the Mongols, they love Genghis Khan. If you see somebody with a mobile phone, you don't see a picture of a child or a, a partner on their phone. You see Genghis Khan everywhere you look. But Jesus is greater than Genghis Khan. Hallelujah. Okay, Judy, thank you. Now, with Mongolia, if you've ever been before, you've ever read about it, you get mostly, you get four seasons in most days. So it's quite interesting. So they can talk about the weather more than people in the UK can, but they don't actually talk about the weather. They've got more on their minds, I think. So... When we were in Ulaanbaatar, one of the things we did, we went to the children's orphanage and the children's home there. And the leadership team there are all born-again believers. So this is really powerful. We had amazing prayer times with them every morning before the children came through and some great words there. And one of the main leaders there, he'd done an amazing, which you'll see in a minute, amazing painting in one of the children's rooms of like the creation and he said it was a very prophetic kind of painting because he believed the light in this painting was God's light was going to fall on Mongolia and the church was going to get stronger and that sort of thing. But he believed that God was saying to him, they had this great big long outer wall in the children's home. And he believed God had said to him, you know that outer wall there? Somebody's going to come on a mission team, right? And they're going to do this amazing painting around it. And they're going to do a prophecy painting as well. And then we turned up. And Gwyn, who was the manager of Feed the Hungry UK on our team, said, do you know what? God's told me to do a painting on that wall, a biblical painting. And the last part of the wall, I'm going to do a prophetic painting of what God's told me about Mongolia. So this guy is like, wow, that's amazing. God is speaking there. So on the left, we started the painting here in the nice hot sunshine. And on the right here... It's a little bit cold day, fingers are all tingling, you need gloves and it's snowing and you think, wow, this is strange. And on the team we had mostly people from the UK and the one lady from Hong Kong. She was the manager of the office in Hong Kong, Feed the Hungry. And I'm stood there painting the wall with this lady from Hong Kong, the director of Feed the Hungry. And you know, it's one of those moments when God is speaking to you because as I was painting the wall with this lady, she suddenly started to talk to me about the Jewish people. And I thought, wow. And she said, do you know much about them? I thought, yeah, just a little bit. And she started to tell me a little bit about them and her love for the Jewish people. I didn't say much about it at that point. And she started to tell me how her church community had been out to a community in China called the Kaifang Jews and ministered to them and all this kind of thing. And I thought, wow. God, he's definitely speaking to me here. He's brought me to Mongolia. He stuck me in the capital, painting a wall in a children's orphanage. He's placed a lady next to me from Hong Kong who is telling me about the Jewish people who clearly has a love for them, as I do as well. 
And next thing on my mobile phone, I get an email from Operation Exodus on that same day saying, your volunteering has come through. Judy and myself are going to volunteer with Operation Exodus. And you're going to Moldova in September to bless the Jewish people. Praise the Lord. And it was almost like God was saying, right, this is what you should be doing now, right? And now you're doing what you should be doing now. I'll tell you what's coming next. So this was a very powerful moment. And it's one of those moments where you think, this is a little bit surreal. I'm stood in Mongolia. You know, my fingers are getting chilled trying to paint a wall. And you're telling me, God, what's happening next? So that was ace for me. Okay. By the way, we're, we're painting the six days of creation, if you wondered what we are painting. But you'll see that in a minute. So Olam Bator, which means red nation, it was a legacy of the communists. Um, red, obviously red is for communism. Um, but haven't changed the name yet from Olam Bator. So we did a lot of visiting of families in the city as well. And this is a typical home called a... We probably know it as a yurt in Mongolian. It's like a, a gear as well. So, so it's the building you can see is white. It's a round building, heavily lagged and insulated. And you walk inside, and there's the beds around the perimeter of the gear, and there's a wood burner in the middle where they burn the logs to keep warm, and they cook the food on the top of the burner. And that's about all they have. So if you wanted to use the toilet, there's a nice little shack there outside. And when it gets minus 40 in the winter, it's not too good. So forget all your creature comforts in Mongolia. It's um, a little bit different. So we, we visited a lot of families like this because where Feed the Hungry is at the minute is the feeding program for Mongolia will start properly in June where the shipments will start to now go out. And a lot of this trip was making contacts with people in Mongolia the church and other organizations, what do you need, when do you need it, where do you need it, that, all the logistics side of it as well. Okay. So here we are in Ulaanbaatar. This is in the children's home. And as you can see there, we're having a bit of a fun time with the children. You know, you might look at the pictures and think, well, they don't look too bad, Marco. They dress quite nicely. They look happy enough. Don't seem as bad as you're making out. Well, when you actually find out the background of these children, wow, they've got some incredible stories of how they've been treated. A lot of them are, have been street children as well. And we had a few of them gave their testimonies. And my goodness, you don't realize how blessed we are. So you might recognize my good self in those pictures, playing a bit of Connect Four there with some of them. And you can see in the right-hand photo some of the painting I was telling you about that the man of the children's home had painted already of the creation. So, yeah, so that was some really good times there. Thank you, Judy. So, yeah, the picture on the left is not one I took. It's just one I borrowed off somebody else. But this is, there's still a big problem with street children in the city. And this is not an uncommon picture that you would come across. So... What I was trying to get across here was the contrast. Here they are stuck in some manhole cover trying to keep warm. And on the right hand side, they're in the children's home, being fed, clothed, educated. And they were also keen to take the paintbrush off us and have a go at painting the wall as well. And it was just great that they felt part of that. So, thank you. Yeah, and here we are bit of feeding the hungry so you know the one thing I did notice of the children there in the UK often children are like so hyper and fighting each other to get first in the queue we're in Mongolia even though they had so little everybody seemed so orderly queues and after you and not rushing everywhere and with the children's home a lot of the children some of them live there but some of them come live with their own families and they come here at dinner time for their main meal of the day then they probably go back to school though there was a mixture of different children doing different things some of them lived there some of them did not so and we we spent some good time with the children you know we did the face painting thing going on there with the tigers and the pandas whatever and i was given the assignment of because in romania i did the you know the balloon art what do you call that where you twist it in shapes and that 
I mean, I took about, I must have taken over a thousand balloons from Party Planet in Lincoln with the pump, pumping them all up like that. And then I, had a, I took a little chart with different ones they could do. So they came along and went, dog. Oh, you want a dog? Well, there you are. So they had a, like huge lines forming and it was a great time and uh, they thoroughly enjoyed themselves and we did as well. And I also took out, I mean, this was quite fun as well. I took out, I kept a little ladybird history book of when I was young of Marco Polo. I thought, that might come in, because he went across Mongolia. So I took that with me, and I got it out of my bag, and they were like, oh, and they all formed a big circle around me. And I just started reading this book. I couldn't understand them. They couldn't really understand me, because the interpreter wasn't there at the time. But they were laughing and pointing, and I think they got a little bit of the gist of what I was talking about. But well, that was just one of the moments that was really you know just interacting with them and blessing the children showing them god's love and just spending quality time with them that was really a blessing now if you look at these photos straight away you might think oh that's nice you had a nice party jelly and ice cream few sausage rolls that kind of thing well it's not really what we were doing when i said speaking life that's what i mean Remember the background a lot of these children. They were probably street children. They'd been abused in some way. There's some harrowing stories. So a lot of the team who came from the Leicester church, they had a prophecy that one of them was going to take with them to Mongolia a lot of crowns. And they took with them these crowns. They found them somewhere, and we fastened them together. And what we did was we had all the children sat down, and one by one, each of the team members would take a crown, we would place it on the head of the child, and we would speak words of life over them, and we would prophesy over them. And it was, this was so powerful, I can tell you. And I just put queens and kings. And you know, in this spiritual, this was very powerful because after we'd done all of this, and then we had the dinner with them, we sat down with them, I said to somebody, wow, I'm sitting in the presence of kings. I remember saying that, and you might think, he's only wearing a cardboard crown, get over yourself. But this was a spiritual thing we had just done. And it helped me understand, and this is what we need to understand as well, that we are kings and queens through the blood of Jesus. We are royalty. And speaking those words of life over these children, that was a powerful, powerful thing we were doing over these children. And um, it was amazing. It was an amazing thing to do. Something that sounds so simple, it was very profound. Thank you. So here we are on the days of creation at the children's orphanage. And what Quinn did, Quinn's the bit of the artist one, so he, would, he drew it all out. They gave a paintbrush to some of us willing people, and this was the result. But it was a lovely transformation, and the children all got involved in it. And it was just a wonderful legacy. Like when we were in Romania, we did this amazing thing of Noah's Ark, the creation, David and Goliath. And we're even getting reports now of what impact that is having on the children as they're looking at the images. Um, they remember that God created the earth, that they're not insignificant. There's a reason they were made. There, is, there is a reason why they were born in Mongolia for such a time as this. Thank you. So I just compared those two paintings for you as well. The one on the left is the one the, the leader of the children's orphanage had already done. And that was, it was wonderful because on one side he had this picture and on the other wall he had like a picture of heaven. And I'm thinking, wow, these children are getting some powerful words, some powerful input into their lives because they're hearing the word all of the time and they're being soaked in it. And these are going to be the next world changes in Mongolia. And on the right hand side, this is Quinn from our team. And he did, it was like the, the prophecy picture and the team sort of inputted into this, and it was like a mountain scene and the river coming from the mountain. So what it was, to begin with, Mongolia and the spiritual was dry and barren. There was no life in there. It was a lifeless kind of place because it was trapped in communism and Buddhism and all that kind of thing. But God has moved to Mongolia, and the river of life has started to run, and that river of life is now flowing out of Mongolia to the nations. Because in Mongolia, we stayed in the, the Bible school, and it was a privilege to see there was quite a good number, I think there was 12 or 15 younger people who are in the Bible school for a number of years. And they will then go out 
with the new missionaries in Mongolia and beyond. When we had the privilege of speaking in the Bible school, sharing some things, and praying with them in the Bible school as well, through the interpreter, that was very powerful. So the prophecy picture there, I thought, how powerful is that? Whoever comes and goes from the orphanage would be struck by this picture that is a representation of what God is saying. So Gwyn had the word for Mongolia. He said, the word God had for Mongolia is wonderful. And I had a picture of a banner over Mongolia, a banner of God's love. And it was very powerful, um, all this imagery. It really was. So that, there are a few of the things that we got up to while we were out there. Thank you, Judy. Yeah, th this is in the town called Henty. So we spent a lot of time at Ulaanbaatar, and then six hours to the west was a town called Henty where Genghis Khan was born. And then beyond that, you'd eventually reach Kazakhstan. Um, so in Henty, we went out to a lot of the families who most of the people there lived in gears, those round buildings I showed you earlier. And the poverty was very profound. And I'll just read you a little bit from the latest Feed the Hungry newsletter, because Gwyn, Gwyn and I, see we split up into different groups. Gwyn and I went to some families with our interpreter and other people went somewhere else. And Gwyn and I ended up in this gear here. And I just wanted to read you what you put. One of the life-changing stories I can tell you about is a boy called Suka. Now, Suka, if you look at the left-hand photo, there's myself on the left. To my right, that's Suka, the older-looking boy in the middle, behind the youngster. A young man of about 16 years old that we came across, he had been left to care for his three younger siblings whilst his mother was in hospital, and he'd not seen his mother for over three months, so nobody knew what was happening there. He was fatherless, and he was left to fend for his sisters of 11, 8, and a brother of 3, with less than 20 pounds per month to feed the four of them. And the three-year-old is the one in the front. So, you know, that was incredible, because we ended up going there, and there was no food, there was no money, there was no nothing. So we went to the local shop, and we bought a load of food in for him, and it was very powerful because you could see the weight of all that responsibility. Imagine being 16 and you've got all your siblings to look after. There's no money going on. There's no food. There's nothing. And it, we were able to just bless him in that way. And then Gwyn has put on here as well. And recently, some of the sisters and brothers are now atten attending the family center run by the church in Hendy. So praise God, they're now going to get input from the church, etc., which will change their lives. Praise God. But this is a common sight. You know, the, that little mite at the front there, when you get close up, they're really dirty and they, they don't get a bath or a shower. There's, there's nothing like that. But in amongst all of that, the right-hand photo there, we sat there talking to them through the interpreter and then suddenly all their friends start piling in and they're all stood there. So the, through the interpreter, we just said, well, what sort of things do you like to do? One of them says, well, I like to sing. Okay. And then... They're singing as a song about the Lord that they've learned at the, the church center. And the other one says, I write poetry. That's great. So they just start saying a little poem about the Lord that she's written at the church center. So even amongst all of that where there is nothing, you know, God is working in the hearts of these children in Mongolia. So it's very powerful. So also all of the people who sowed into my trip to Mongolia, you can see that he's making a powerful impact in these people's lives. Thank you. So here we are again in Hensi. This was the Easter Saturday, and all of the day we spent with the children. So in the morning we spent with the younger children. So we did all the balloons and did all the artwork with the balloons and the face painting, and they, they loved it. And at the end, we, one of them on, the, on our team was a drama teacher. So that was very useful because she was able to reenact and get them all hyped up and they loved it and yes that is me on the right hand photo giving it all that you see when you're on mission right you do all kinds of crazy things as you may or may not know and the chap on the, the right hand photo with his arms up he was he works for um christian aid so 
That was interesting. And it was a real blessing. A great team um, in Henty, the Mongolian team leadership there. And like I said to you before, at least four of them had a testimony that involved beating alcoholism because it is three times the level of what it is in Europe, the problem with alcoholism. So that was an amazing time. And then in the afternoon, we spent the time with the older teenagers, so 13, 14 plus. And it was, you know, children are children wherever you go in the world. That's what I found out. Same with teenagers. And the teenagers walked in, all cool. I don't want to get involved in that. I'm too cool for that. But gradually, the barriers broke down. And the, dra the drama teacher, it was really good because she got them to reenact a story about Jesus reaching out to the woman with the issue of blood. So we had one of them playing the lady, then we had the crowd, then we had one of them who would play Jesus, and they, re they really got involved. It wasn't like, oof, not doing that, oh, that's stupid. They really got into it, and they, you could see they were really loving it, and they got the message of the gospel through it. That was so powerful. And they all came on the Easter Sunday and did it in front of the church. So it was great because I was able to do the drama with them and, yeah, fellowshipping with them as well. It was great. Thank you. Yeah, and while we were at Henty as well, this, this was the spontaneity of it as well. One of the evenings, we, we ended up having this shared meal with the leadership of the church, and then suddenly out of that, we were into a worship time. All the tables went away. They got the microphone rigged up at the front. So if you had a word from the Lord or you wanted to say something, you could just come to the front and give a word. And that was powerful. And one thing that had a big effect on me, while we were there worshipping and like that, I had my eyes shut, and suddenly I thought, hello, I recognize that noise. One of them had a shofar. He's the ram's horn from you know, the Old Testament when they blew the ram's horn. And when you hear the ram's horn blown, that has, well, it had a powerful effect on me, but it was blown for many different reasons. But when I heard it, I... God gave a word to me for the church. When I heard that straight away, he gave me a word. So I just went to the front and had a word for the church and was able to bless them through that. And uh, yeah, it, it's, it's amazing, really, the things. Now, this photo here on the left-hand side, it shows you that the ice and snow take a while to clear in Mongolia. Um, we went this place in Ulaanbaatar, and the river was still thick ice in places, so you could walk on it. But in one place, it was like this big crevasse. It was like punched straight through, and you could see through to the river, and we were walking around it. And um, God gave me a word about it, and he says, he was saying to me that the impact that your mission trip is having now and in the future is like what you're seeing there. That's the imagery, where it all seems thick ice. You can't penetrate it. It's so, so thick. But God said... I've punched through it all because it's not by might and it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. And the mission trip that you've had now and the legacy that you're lead, leaving because you've sown seed into very fertile soil. And I had this word as well before I went about sowing seed into ultra-fertile soil in Mongolia because it is, and you might think, 86% Buddhism, I don't think so. But forget that, the church is on the move. And it's having a powerful impact in people's lives. So that's why I wanted to show you the image, imagery of, the, of the, the ice on the river there. And on the right-hand side, that was the team, the leadership team from the church in Henty that we had the worship time with, and we were able to bless them and minister. And on the Easter Sunday, the, the team as well were able to, you know, it was a packed church, and the church was like a great big gear. So it was a great big round yurt, and you went in, I thought, wow, this is amazing. How cool is that to have church in a, in a gear? So I was able to give a testimony in the meeting. And then after the Easter Sunday meeting, 12 people gave their lives to the Lord. That's awesome, isn't it? Praise the Lord. It's not a, a, any special day in Mongolia, Easter Sunday, because Christianity is a very small percentage. But 12, over 12 people came out, gave their lives to the Lord. We were able to pray with them afterwards. And we were able to pray for a lot of people with health problems, things like that. Great testimonies about that as well. So this was an amazing time for us to minister to the people and, and just be a, a blessing. You know, because we were quite a novelty factor. Um, if you get the idea, we're in Mongolia and most of the Mongolian people look fairly similar, not if you understand what I mean. And we're there as Western 
you know, Europeans, and a lot of people were doing a double take. And I've never had my photograph taken so many times. Somebody stops me in the street, hey, give it a bit of that. And um, frame it, put in your album. And yeah, I felt a bit of a celebrity, to be honest with you, at times. I was walking down the street, people going, hey. So we were sat in this hotel lobby one time, and a whole group of them came out, and we had to have a photo with all of them, and shake hands, and say where we were from, and yeah. Ace. So, you know, the thing is in Mongolia as well, what do people do at the minute? If you've got a problem in Mongolia, you can't really go to the church because most places don't have a church. So, and you're probably a Buddhist or you come under a pressure to follow the Buddhist system. You see, we met one family and they'd only been b born again believers for about two years. But her family and the father's family were both Buddhist. So they were under a lot of pressure. Come on, come back to... Buddhist system, you know this silly Christianity business, you, you, you don't need that. So there's a lot of pressure there, family pressures. So if you had a problem, what would you do? Well, what a lot of people do if they've got a health problem or something in their life is not right, they go to the Lama. So the Lama is like the head of the, the Buddhist plan. So we, we would have like the bishop or whatever, they have the Lama. So you go to the Lama and say, hey Lama, I've got this problem, right? I've got this pain and I think I've got a health problem because you can't afford to go to a doctor. So the Lama will say, well, for a little bit of money, uh, I'll read a little bit out of the book of Buddha for you and we'll see how we go. So you pay your money and he reads a bit out of the book of Lama and then, see you then, that's, that's that. So there's no healing, there's nothing happened. People are just trapped in a cycle of paying money to somebody to read out of a book that's not having any power in their lives and devoid. But praise the Lord, they're finding Jesus as well in Mongolia. And there's some great testimonies that are coming out because Buddha is dead, but Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And thank you, Judy. Yeah, so on the way back, so we, we went into Henty, and then from Henty we went back to Ulaanbaatar to do some more ministry in the city. Then we stopped, this is a, just thought I'd show you a typical motorway service station there. It's a joke, it isn't. But we stopped about three hours into the journey and it's just like, crikey, there's nothing here. And somebody said before I go on the trip to Mongolia, one thing that you will experience that you'll never experience before is silence. I thought, what do you mean silence? All I've got to do is switch the telly off at home and that's silence, isn't it? I don't think so. And they were right. Because we went to parts of Mongolia in the middle of nowhere. And there was nothing. It was a different kind of silence. That is true. And a lot of times, you know, saw a lot of eagles out there as well. It was an amazing place for wildlife. And here is a gear. We stayed in this gear. So the last couple of days of the trip, just as a little bit of a novelty, we went to one of the parts of the National Forest. And... We each, well not each of us had a gear, but I stayed with Gwyn in a gear. And the, the trouble with that is if you go on a mission, watch out for the loud snorers. Because I remember this from Romania. And when he said to me, yeah, hey, you and me then, Marco, we'll take this one. Ah, uh, yeah, I forgot my ear defenders. No, I, I didn't actually say that, but he snores as loud as he did in Romania. Sorry, Gwyn, but it's true. If you're watching this, it's only a joke. So we stayed in this gear and it was, it was quite novel, but wow, to live in that? It was just the beds in there, the wood burner. And if you, were my, if you imagine you're living in this thing in the middle of minus 40 in winter, you're trying to keep it burning all of the time to keep the warm. Because when it's hot, it's hot. But when it goes out, crikey, it goes cold. It really does go cold. And the reason they live in these gears is because they're a nomadic kind of way to live. Because most of Mongolia, 45% are still nomads. They travel around. And these things can be assembled in no time at all. They're easily taken down and you can carry them with you no problem at all so that was a great experience good bit of fellowship staying there and you know good walks in the mountains and that kind of thing as well um, yeah it was a good blessing thank you Judy so here we are in the National Forest it was so mountainous um, that's one thing I did really notice that had an impact on me but awesome, really, just spend time in the creation, seeing the eagles, all that kind of thing. That was said, climbing up mountains. It was like recharge your batteries, really. 
Um, that's Gwyn on the left there, and that's my good self on the right. And while I was in Mongolia, I kept getting a word that kept coming back to me, and the word was covered, or you're under a covering. And this was quite interesting because it kept coming up again and again. One of the times we were in a big worship meeting, and I had the, um, the picture I had, we were all wearing garments, um, garments of praise. See, as we're praising the Lord, we, we have a garment of praise upon us, and praise is powerful. Worship is powerful, you see. And it's like you're covered when you're worshiping in that garment of praise. You choose to put it on, and you choose to worship the Lord. And the next thing that I came across is when we stay, we stayed in Ulaanbaatar with Hope International, which are a Christian ministry organization. And in the room, they'd left each of us a card with a scripture on it. And they'd left for me, it was Psalm 91. I'm just going to read this out. If you've got your Bible, you might want to turn with it yourself. So it was Psalm 91, verse 4. And to begin with, I thought, well, yeah, that, that's, that's very nice. But I didn't see the connection straight away. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. So as co you're covered again by the feathers of the Lord Jesus himself. You come under his protection. Like I said last week about the blood is covering us, the protection. So that was interesting as well. So there's more covering going on. And while we were in the mountains like that, there I was with Gwyn. We'd just gone on our own, the two of us. And we were in this the middle of nowhere, climbed up this great big mountain pass. And then I saw, I think it was something like a black kite. It's, that's a big bird of prey. And I saw it fly across and into the side of the mountain. I could clearly see it was on a nest. And it settled itself down. And I could see some chicks po poking their head up from underneath it. I thought... There we go, Psalm 91. I think God was trying to say to me, hey, you're covered under the protection of my wings, praise the Lord. And it's good to remember that, particularly when you're on mission and you're coming against sometimes a lot of negative stuff. And, you know, the devil might be saying, what are you doing here? They don't want to listen to anything you've got to say. And you've got to come against all that nonsense. And also, while we were in the mountains, there was all different unusual shapes of um, crevices in the mountains and there was one particular place where you could just sort of you know just itch your in like that and it was like really tall and straight away I had that picture in my mind I don't know if any of you can recall this in Exodus when Moses had that dialogue with the Lord God and he wanted God to reaffirm his presence with him he wanted to see the Lord's glory and he stood in the in the crevice of the rock. Do you remember that? Well, I just want to read a couple of verses out from this. And if you want to find it, it's in Exodus chapter 33. And it is the power of God's presence. So Moses is talking with God and he's dialoguing. So talk about, start about verse 14. And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. This is God speaking to Moses. So on the dialogue, um, I'll pick it up again. So near the end of the conversation, God passes Moses. He's got him protected in the cleft of the rock, and his glory goes past him. He doesn't actually see the Lord himself. But God, in that, in that moment where he talks to God, God is reaffirming, I will always be with you. I will always protect you. I will always... I've got you covered. Again, that, that same word came out. So that was a very another powerful imagery that God showed me as well. And also, if you remember what I shared last week, and when I was in Mongolia, the word, one of the words I shared with the mission school was being covered by the blood. And do you remember that lamb that I brought last week? I took that to Mongolia, that little lamb that's become quite a bit of a superstar, actually. I shared that with them, and it really opened a lot of their eyes to how powerful the blood covering is because I explained it in terms of old covenant and in terms of the new covenant and the fulfillment of it. And as I was thinking about last week what I shared, how you are covered by the blood of Jesus, I started to think about that as well. And what came into my mind was that bit from Revelations chapter, two, chapter 5 where John has the vision, I don't know if you remember this, he saw the vision of God who's sitting on the throne. He's got a scroll. And God is saying, who is worthy to open this scroll? 
And they looked around, they there doesn't seem to be anybody about to open it. And John starts crying, oh, there's nobody to open this scroll. But then one of the 24 elders says, hey, you don't need to cry because there is one who is worthy. The Lord Jesus himself who died, shed his blood and, and is risen from the dead. So then John says, I saw a lamb that looked like it had just been slain. Do you remember that bit? That looks like it had just been slain. I thought, well, it's either dead or it's not dead, if you see what I mean. But John said, it looked like it was slain. So when I thought about that, I thought, if it's just been slain, what does that mean? Ah, its blood must be the freshest of all. So if you've just been slain as a lamb, the blood is fresh, is it not? So the picture that I got from that was, it's kind of saying that Jesus' blood is always fresh and powerful and dynamic. He never dries up. It never fades away. You never need to get more of it. He's always there. So I thought this was, and I just want to read a couple of verses from Revelation chapter 5 that I've just explained as well. So it's Revelation chapter 5 if you want to make a note of it. So I'll just pick it up from, so it's, uh, there, there was a lamb as that, that looked as though it had been slain. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls of incense, which are prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song and they said, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. For you were slain and you have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue, and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God hallelujah so when I read the rest of that bit I thought yeah every tribe every well I tend to call them people groups every people group the blood is available for all it's available for people in Mongolia it doesn't matter if you're a Buddhist it doesn't matter if you're a Muslim in Boko Haram it doesn't matter if you're a Hamas Fatah it doesn't matter if you're an Orthodox Jew it doesn't matter the blood as I said last week, he's no respecter of persons. Do you remember when I said about the old covenant? If some of the Egyptians had said, do you know what? These Israelites might have got it right here. I think I'm going to take a lamb myself and I'm going to slay it and do exactly what they're doing. I'm going to copy them. I'm going to stay in my house with the blood over the doorpost. They would have been saved because they would have believed, they would have acted and believed what God had said. So the blood is no respecter of persons. Hallelujah. I think that's the last photo, isn't it, Julie? Yeah, I think it is. So, that's a little bit, in a nutshell, what we got up to. Now, since getting back, you see, when you go on a mission trip, it doesn't just stop there, because the seeds you have sown, it, the fruit will start to come forth as well, and things will start to happen, and things will come out of that. Well, since I've got back as well, I've there's loads of people who suddenly want me to do a talk here, there, and everywhere, and... That's a positive thing in a way. Why is that positive? Because I'm not there just to promote Feed the Hungry. I'm there to share the gospel as well. So that's a positive thing. And also there are a few groups in the Louth area who have said to me, hey, we, we, we do this way you, what do they call it, knit and natter. Have you ever heard of that? Knit and natter groups. And the, it was surprising because one of them in the town had lost their contact or they didn't need any more of this particular charity. And I got talking to them about Mongolia. They said, hey, does Feed the Hungry need anything? I said, yeah, probably. So I found out, and they do. And, you know, this, the look on their faces, they were so empowered and so blessed because I said, yeah, all that stuff that you're knitting, that can go out shipments, Nicaragua, Mongolia, Romania, wherever in the world where Feed the Hungry sends shipments, that can go out. And they were so blessed by it. They said, hey, come and do, give us a talk. And, and little things like that, you might think, well, that's a bit insignificant, but it has a powerful effect on other people, and the, me and the message is spread on. So as I said, every child every day is what Feed the Hungry do. So they say, every week, this number of children we are going to feed in all of these countries of the world, including Mongolia. And that's what, they, what they're going to do. And I'll finish with this as well. Years ago, I had a prophecy, and one of the things that I was told was I would be involved in feeding children in the right way. And I used to meditate on that. I'm thinking, the right way, what, what does that mean? The right nutrition? The right kind of, I don't know. And I prayed about it a lot, and I didn't really understand. And then God revealed to me 
well, just before the trip ready, he said, you've already been feeding children in the right way. I said, what, what does that mean? Spirit, soul, and body. You're going across there to bless the children. You're filling their stomachs that are empty, first of all, and you're nourishing them. There's the physical side, right? And then you're blessing them because you're giving them the materials to go to school or to have clothing or everything they need for this physical life as well. But also, and the most important thing of all, you're revealing my son, the Lord Jesus, to them as well. And that's the legacy for all time. And when I thought about it, it's right, because, you know, when you share with people, you say, oh, I've been on a trip to Mongolia. Oh, that's great. Who did you go with? Yeah, feed the hungry. Right. So they ask you a bit more, and then you say, yeah, and we, we shared about Jesus with them. Oh, did you? Oh, right. And then they go a bit quiet, because they can understand the humanitarian bit, that you've gone out to feed people, and that all sounds very good. But as soon as you mention about the rest of it, people kind of misunderstand you and say, we're not going over there to ram the gospel. Feed the hungry are working with the church to build a church up in all of these countries and work with them to help children, people understand the gospel message. Praise the Lord. So I just wanted to share that with you as well because if it was just merely feeding children, I, I might as well go out with the World Food Program or something like that. It's, it's okay. That's, that's not a problem. To physically feed children is good. But it's so much more than that, isn't it? It's so much more because we're giving them something that will last throughout eternity and we're giving them the chance to become world changers like we are. See, we're world changers in, in Victory Church, are we not? So even if you're not able to go out on mission, you can pray, you can sow into mission. And you know, all the things that I've experienced, the people who have sowed into my trip and prayed into my trip, you, you're blessed through this as well, by the way. You're not just a bystander. Um, we're in for all part of the same body. And it's an amazing thing. And also, since, since then, I, I approached the company I work for and said, oh, out of interest, I've been out with Feed the Hungry, and I told them a bit about it, and they said, oh, marvelous, can you do an interview with us? So I did an interview, and I thought they were going to produce a little newsletter. The next thing, I found myself in the local press. I thought, all oh, right, I didn't realize it was going in the press. The next thing, can you come and do an interview with Radio Lincolnshire next week? Well, I'm not trying to become a superstar or a celebrity A-lister. <laughs> what I'm trying to do is say, look, oh, this is what Feed the Hungry are doing, and that's great because they're feeding spirit, soul, and body. And, you know, I'm going to really pray about what I say on the radio because I want to glorify the Lord Jesus because that's what it's all about, is it not? So I, I hope you got something out of what I've just shared now. Um, and also, oh, yeah, there's one other thing with Feed the Hungry as well. I had um, desire or feeling, I'm not quite sure, a long time ago to develop a product, I felt there must be a gap in the markets, the market, that was maybe the wrong word, a gap in the feeding in some way in Mongolia. And with my background in food technology, I thought, is there a need, is there something that we, we are lacking in Feed the Hungry to have a better food product? You can store it better, deliver it better, better nutrition. So I talked with the, some of the US directors and they said, this is, sounds a good idea. So talk to Gwyn in the UK office and, and I told him about it and he said, yeah, that sounds a really good idea because I've been really thinking recently that we need a better product that we can start in the UK because there's, there's a lot of poverty, food poverty in the UK as well, as you probably know. I was really starting to think about something we can use in the UK to start with. So we're going to go over and we're going to have a, a chat about this and see what we can do. But you see, when you start involving yourself in things like this, there's so many things that come out of it. And somebody even said to me, um, recently, they said, well, even if all of your training and experience in food technology, even if it was for this one thing, that would be awesome. And I thought, yeah, you're right, actually, it would be. So it's been a blessing to be involved with Feed the Hungry, and I think um, my time with Feed the Hungry is not just a one-off. I think it is something that will become stronger and more involved, and um, yeah, praise the Lord. When, when you have a desire, God puts desires in our hearts. You know, I didn't wake up one day and go, oh, I really want to pray for the Orthodox Jews because they're the last people you should be praying for. They're the most difficult people on earth. It comes from the Holy Spirit. And to involve yourself in things like this and do mission trips, the Holy Spirit puts the desire in there and he equips you. If he calls you to do something, he equips you. You don't just go out there 
vulnerable and exposed, you can go out there, like I said last week, bleeding the blood of Jesus. You go under the power and authority of the blood of Jesus. When you go, I went Kenny, when you go to Nigeria and Judy, when you're going to do this trip and all of these places. It's an honor and it's a blessing to go out to these lands, I think, and share um, what Jesus has done for us and to pass it on to these people. Amen. Peace.